Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary with the Get Some Podcast. And my guest this week is... <laughs> this motherfucking Gary. <laughs> Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. Uh, I'm going to start with my schedule uh, right off the bat. This weekend, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland at the Baltimore Comedy Factory. That is February 22nd through the 25th. And I'm there for another week, February 29th through March 3rd. I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. And then we get into March, uh, March 8th through the 10th. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. At Zany's, and then March 15th through 17th, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona at Stand Up Live. Then March 22nd through the 24th, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina at uh, the Improv. And then, you know what? Let me just let me just go into April real quick before we get started. Because I know I got Houston for two weeks straight. Uh, let me see. Here we go. I'm in, let me see, where am I? I'm in Houston. Um, Houston. Sorry about that. I should have been more prepared. My fault, everybody. Houston. Uh, Houston is Raleigh. And then Houston. So April 4th through the 7th, I'm in Houston. Then April 11th through the 14th, I'm in Houston. And then don't forget, March 29th, I'm in Wichita, Kansas. And March 30th, I'm in Evansville, Indiana. And bring in the, the new guy, OG Stank, the mailman, with me. We did a funny sketch, sketch this week on Instagram if you guys want to check it out. It's, it's funny. Uh, last week, I was in Orlando, Florida at the uh, it's the Funny Bone now. I thought it was improv. It's the Funny Bone. Uh, here's the thing. So I go to Orlando. I do the shows this weekend in Orlando, and, and thanks everybody for coming out. We packed out six shows. We sold out five of six. Uh, so it was a great weekend. But it rained heavily Saturday and Sunday. And I kept thinking, man, if you got tickets to Disney or Epcot or Animal Kingdom, any of those, any of those Disney umbrella uh, music parks, Shouldn't there be a contingency on weather? When cause you got families that literally save up. See, that was that was their vacation for the year. And if they go there and it just storms, I, I know you don't have, have control of the weather. There's gotta be some contingency. I mean, Disney, you are a multi-billion dollar business. And I just can't imagine. This isn't a one-off for some people. Nobody goes to Disney by themselves. It's it's a family event. So you're literally got you got a mom, a dad, and you got kids dictating if they're out of school or not. And a lot goes into these Disney trips. And believe me, I've been on plenty of them in my life. So when it rains both days, oh my God. I wish they could just like I I don't know, maybe can you buy a ticket that's open end? It doesn't have to be for that day. Uh hopefully they do. I I don't know how it is anymore. I haven't been in a while, but when I used to go, it was you buy the ticket for that particular day. So hopefully they got tickets that you could, if it's storming and somebody doesn't show up. Because, I mean, it was storming. You couldn't go. I mean, you could, but what, it ain't going to be no fun. It's rain all day. I don't know, just something I thought of. But shouts out to MC Search that came through. Uh, did a little time. That guy's doing stand-up now. It's interesting. Uh, so listen, last week I started to sh- – I, I, I forgot – this is what I do. I forget sometimes. The ADHD kicks in. So two weeks ago, I was talking about my stepdad, some crazy stories with him. And then I was talking about my brother Dallas. And I said, I got a real funny story, but I'll share it next week. And I completely forgot. And a couple people reminded me, yo, I tuned in to hear about your brother's story. You didn't tell it. And I go, oh. So, okay, this is what I said. My brother had some funny stories. Be- Listen, being a drug addict isn't funny. Uh, but man, some of their stories are so off the wall. It, <laughs> so my brother Dallas, who nice guy died 2015 of a heroin overdose. It was really fentanyl that killed him. And, uh, but 
I got another brother, Kyle. Now, Kyle was is he also was dealing drugs, doing drugs and stuff. But Kyle was Kyle's always more aggressive than than Dallas. Dallas more mild manner, laid back, night just nice. Kyle's more in your face, ready to fight. He was robbing people, things like that. Just just he was he was he's a wild dude. He's a wild dude. So Kyle comes to my brother Dallas and says, Hey, I came across five hundred dollars worth of weed. This is before weed was legal. This is probably this is probably two I'm guessing two thousand eleven, maybe, maybe two thousand twelve, somewhere around there. And he said, Hey, I came across well first, I'm sorry, let me specify preface this. My brother Dallas texted me and said, Hey, call me. Kyle's pissed. And I was like, do you need money? He goes, no, it's just, I, I'm, I'll handle it, but Kyle's pissed at me. Call me. So I called him and I said, what's up? He's man, Kyle's mad at me, man. I don't know what to do. And I said, well, what's the story? So <laughs> Dallas says, Kyle called him and said, Hey Dallas, I got $500 worth of weed. No, he said, I got, uh, what do you say? I got enough weed that you should make a thousand dollars off of. He goes, I got it for five hundred, but if you sell it, you can make a thousand. He said, so just give me the five hundred back. I'll be even, and then you can keep five hundred. So Kyle came to Dallas saying, Hey, I got a way that I can break even, but you can make five hundred dollars, which is a complete bullshit story. Kyle stole that weed, or he came across it somehow. And for for you to say, there, what, this is what I know about my brothers. Kyle did not pay for five hundred dollars for that weed, and is willing to just break even. And I, I'm going to come for a way for Dallas to make money. It, it, I'm sure it was stolen in some aspect. So, just so we're not confused, my brother Kyle went to Dallas, said, "Hey, I got enough weed that if you sell it, you can make a thousand dollars. Just give me five hundred. That's what I paid for it, and you keep the other five hundred." I'm just looking to break even. I'm a nice guy. You can make $500. Dallas tells me this story. I'm like, so what's the problem? Dallas says, man, he goes, you know, I, I, he gave me all this weed, and I ended up just, like, giving it away, smoking some of it. <laughs> he goes, so now it's gone, and I don't have the $500 to give Kyle. I didn't make any money. And I, he goes, so Kyle's pissed at me. Because now Kyle's like, you owe me $500. And I go, well, do you want me to give you $500? And Dallas is like, no, no, no. I, I got into it. I'll get out of it. And I go, all right. And then he just goes, uh, <laughs> and he just goes, you know, Gary, I don't, I don't know what I'm good at in life, but I am not a good drug dealer. <laughs> like he came to the epiphany. Oh my God. I am too nice of a guy. I'll just give the drugs away. So <laughs> But it was the, it was the pause. He was like, "Man, I don't know what I'm good at, but I'm not a good drug dealer." <laughs> I was like, when I said I damn near hung up the phone, I I only ever heard anything that funny in my life. It was just the way he said it. it like he really, in his heart of hearts, came to the epiphany. He was not a good drug dealer. This is why I know Kyle and my brother Kyle. Hey. That, that that we was stolen from somebody. I know that. And I think Kyle just wanted to get it off his hands and give it to Dallas, but whatever. That's a whole nother story. So uh I got I got a, I got an award this week. I, uh I went back to my hometown, Oxford, Ohio, and they did this new thing. Like most high schools they have Hall of Fames and, and usually it's like sports hall of fames. And most high schools, I, I thought this was very cool that my high school did. They came up with this thing called Hall of Achievement. So what it is, it's just people that have done well in their perspective fields. And this is the first time it's ever been done at high school. We were the first inaugurating award class, whatever you want to call it. So it's like it's a Hall of Fame, but they call it a Hall of Achievement. And they're going to put our, I guess they're putting pictures and plaques up down a certain hallway. And they're going to do this every year. They're going to, people get nominated. They go back. They find who's been doing well in life and and it was cool. Like one guy was a one guy's a surgeon, and he's come up with all these um, these groundbreaking treatments to to help people, which is that's like God's work right there. And then another guy was started out as a chef, and now he owns a bunch of restaurants. Owns one at uh, I believe Aria in Vegas, so he's doing well. 
Uh, it was just it was just one one guy's a politician. It was just some impressive individuals. And then I got in. Somebody nominated me, and they have a they have like a a ten team board that votes, and and I got in just for movies and stand up and and that stuff. And I was the last one to speak. Oh, one guy was a, a, a New York Times writer. That was you know he he he's really done some impressive stuff too. But I uh, whenever I was the last person to speak. Obviously, I'm the funny one, and uh, it was it was almost like a mini class reunion of old teachers, classmates I saw there, and it was, it was we had a good turnout to be such a small town and a small high school, and everyone got up, and everyone like most awards programs, they thank they thank their their wives, they thank their uh, they thank their parents and things like that, and staff members from the past, and so I'm the last one to speak. So I get up there, and of course I'm making a couple jokes, making it lighthearted. I said I was the, I'm definitely the, I have the lowest GPA of all the award awardees this year. And then, I, I think when I went up there, it hit me. I go, oh my god, I don't, I'm not gonna thank my mom, I'm not gonna thank my dad. Neither of them are here, and they're both still alive. They're not together, but they're alive. And then, obviously, everybody knows my kids aren't talking to me, and it was just like. Man, like, but I had a nice group of people there. So I think most people, the natural instinct is you want to unload on the people that aren't there, right or wrong, right or wrong. Um, but I was like, okay, I was just appreciative of the people that did take time to come in. So I had my, uh, my Aunt Doris, her husband, Bob, my Uncle Daryl, his wife, Karen, and then my Aunt Linda came. And then, uh, and the, the my aunts and uncles and that they couldn't make it, they sent me text and everything like, "Sorry, we're out of town and stuff." So I, I I was appreciative that I had them, and then my my buddy Mike came in and my buddy Paul. Now these two guys are two guys I went to high school with, and I, when I was on set, when I was on stage, I said, "Man, if they had a hall for just cool ass dudes, these guys should be in it." And and I got a little not a little, I got a lot choked up in the middle of my speech because. It's crazy that where we had this ceremony, it was this beautiful building and it was right like less than a half a mile from the trailer park where I grew up in. So I'm sitting here going, God, talk about the past meeting the present in this moment. Because I, I was like, wow, this is right next to the trailer park. And you could have walked. So I'm sitting there reminiscing and I said, you know, my 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 buddy Mike, I was like, when I was a senior in high school, I didn't take the SAT or ACT. I didn't even know. I thought you you took that during the week. I didn't know you had to come in on a Saturday. Nobody in my family went to college. And maybe that says something about my counselor. She might should have told me, but, but I didn't know because I remember so uh, like everybody's like, "Yo, where were you Saturday? We was all here to take the SAT." I was like, "What?" So really, my senior year, halfway through, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know anything. I'm just living in a trailer, thinking stuff's just gonna happen. And I wake up on Saturday morning, my buddy Mike, who was at my ceremony last night, he wakes me up. He goes, Gary, wake up, wake up. And his dad's in the driveway. They go, come on, man. And I go, I go, what, what, what? I'm coming to. And keep my, I'm still trying to figure out how this dude got in my trailer. I'm sure my mom let him in. but Because it's like 7, 8 a.m. on a Saturday. And him and his dad drove me down the recruiting station. And it was like, back then it was like the Navy, the Army, and the uh, Marines were all in the same building, like right next to each other. I don't know where the Air Force and Coast Guard was, but they were separate. But I met with all three that morning. And Mike had joined the Navy. So obviously the Navy had a leg up on me. I was like, all right, I want to – Mike brought me down here. I want to do what Mike's doing. I was very much like – Mike helped me out a lot in high school. So I ended up joining the Navy. And on the way down there, Mike was like, man, what you doing? What you doing after high school? And I was like, I don't know. He goes, you got to get out of here, man. You you got to join something today. They, he, he Basically, him and his dad was like, you're going to be stuck, bro. You're going to be stuck here. And I was like, all right. So I ended up joining the Navy. And so when I'm up there get, getting this award, I see Mike and, like, everything just came rushing back. And I was like, wow, this dude, like, kind of saved me a little bit, saved my life a little bit. If you look at it like that, because – in life, like these little things changes the direction of your life. 
and, and you don't realize until you get older, you look back and you're like, man, this one little thing, if he would not have woke me up and dragged me down to the recruiting station, because it goes, I always say, like, I didn't know where I wanted to go. I just know where I didn't want to be. I don't want to be stuck in that trailer. And I did like a middle finger to my stepdad because my stepdad was always like, you got to, man, he was like telling me, like, I got to move out at 18. I got to move out at 18. I don't, I don't care what you want to do, but 18, you're out of here. I used to always harp on that. So I, when I joined the Navy, I left at 17. So I kind of gave him the middle finger, like, bruh, I left before I'm 18. <laughs> and that, and purposely, my birthday, July 26th, I remember telling the recruiter, when can I get out of here? And he was like, well, you can leave in June. And I was thinking, I don't want to leave that soon because I'm graduating high school in June. I wanted at least a month just to honestly just get ready mentally, hang out with my friends and say goodbye to everybody and all that stuff. And so I said, well, I don't want to leave in June. And he said, well, we got to, I remember it was July 23rd and then I could have waited till August or September. I said, July 23rd, my birthday, July 26th. I want to be in the Navy before I'm 18. I want to be in at 17. And, uh, so my 18th birthday, I, I celebrated in boot camp. But I think when, I think it would hit me like, man, everybody that got, everybody that got it, uh, accepted into the quote unquote Hall of Fame last night, they all was thanking their mom and dad. And I was just like, dang. One, one, one was, one guy was pretty heartfelt. His mom, he said his mom passed away 14 years ago and she was a teacher at our school. And I remember her being a teacher and I was like, oh, wow. I said, I forgot that's his mom. And so I'm sitting there like, dang, well, neither my mom and dad are here to celebrate this with me. And, and they're both still alive, but I just, I don't have nothing with them right now. So I don't think I ever will, honestly. Uh, so, yeah, but I, I, I appreciate the people that did show up though. You know, the, my buddy, Mike, my buddy, Paul, and both of them had to work the next day. Mike drove three hours from Huntington, West Virginia. Paul drove two hours down from Columbus, Ohio to, to make this just to be there for me. So very appreciative. And I think the older I get, the more uh, I just want to tell people how I feel about them. And sometimes I'm not good at that. And it, in the moment, I get a little emotional when I when you try to open up as a dude. But it was important. I'm glad I got to tell Mike and Paul uh, what they meant to me and how much they helped me in high school. It was important. It was cool. And it was cool to get the award. It was cool. Uh but man, I was an emotional wreck up there. <laughs> I was like, oh, I had a camera guy there. He took a he took a couple of pictures of me and one. I'm just, Ugh. I said, yeah, don't post that, please. And I don't know if I, maybe I'll post a speech. I know that it got recorded. I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I'm not sure yet. But I, I, I made sure I didn't focus on who wasn't there and who who I didn't have. I, I really focused on who was there and I just, you know, I appreciate like I did have good people in my life coming up. But it, they were always, it wasn't within the home. It was out of my home that I had good people that helped me out. So, I, you know, that meant a lot. I, it, and it was, th I was thinking too, like, it, growing up, like, I told you the, the crazy story about my brother, but I, I think the last, this is when I knew with my stepdad, I had to end the relationship. There, there's two things that I noticed. Um, I noticed every time I go over there, he used to always put me down constantly. It was constantly, like constantly put me down. I don't remember him ever saying anything good growing up about me. And I said that a couple weeks ago about the football game. But uh, I remember the, the the what is it, the straw that broke the camel's back, or so to speak. I remember I'm doing at this point. I'm a stand up. I'm successful. I'm doing my thing, and I'm at I'm at some family function, and. I don't know, I told a joke and everybody was laughing or something and goofing off. And my stepdad walked in and he was like, they pay you to tell jokes like that? Are you kidding me? You telling me people pay money to hear jokes like that? And he did it like, like, like kind of being an asshole to me. And I just looked at him and I just went, millions. <laughs> That's all I said. And he just looked at me and I left, got in my car and, and drove. I remember pulling out the driveway. I was like, I felt like I got one on him. I just, it was one word, millions. People pay to hear you tell jokes like that. And I remember he just stared at me. And that's when I pulled out of the driveway. I was like, oh my God, it's like, a, it's like a weight was lifted. And I didn't speak to him again until my brother passed away. And then you try to reconcile and everything. But uh, yeah, that was, that was the moment. That was like, quote unquote, come to Jesus moment. Like, oh, 
He can't even just walk in a room and laugh. He got to take that moment to dig on me. I'm just going, you know what I mean? God, that guy was an angry, weird individual. Like I hear, I, I see some people's comments like, you know, dang, your your child could be a a movie or a TV show. And sometimes I think, yeah, it'd be kind of hard to piece it together. Uh, I guess since I'm on this crazy stepdad story train, I might, might as well tell another one. Uh, this was kind of, I was 10, I think I was 10. Yeah, I was 10 years old. So my stepdad had a buddy and he lived in Kentucky on a, on a, he married this girl and they ran this like gas station slash diner on the lake, some lake in Kentucky. And they lived there like literally like it was like a floating house that real small, but right next to the house was a diner. So literally they would walk out of their front porch and they walk into this diner and then boats would pull up and they could fill up with gas in their boats. And I thought that I thought the two times I went there, I went there twice for two different summers. I thought that was the coolest place. I thought we were living on the lake. It was cool. I slept on the floor. <laughs> I just remember, you know, and. God, we used to swim underneath the where the boats would dock. We'd swim underneath the dock, and you have to go under there. And sometimes you see a snake, and then you'd be like, "Oh!" And you probably wasn't the safest thing because it's like those things where you see the guys get caught in the ice and they're looking for the opening. You literally had to be like, look up and find the opening and come up to get your breath, and then go back down and swim out. Probably wasn't the safest thing to do, but you know, you in Kentucky, baby, do what Kentucky people do. And uh, every now and you see a snake just slithering along. And they was like, just leave it alone. Just a little garden snake. Because <laughs> you, you get to know the other kids that live on the boats and the lakes there. And um, But my, my, my stepdad's buddy, Jerry, cool guy. Uh, to me, he was cool. It, it, was, it was my stepdad's best friend. It was Rod's best friend. So he, I'm, the diner doesn't open until like noon, let's say. And I walked in there in the morning, and Jerry's prepping the diner getting ready for people to come in and stuff and I, he had like a milkshake machine and i said i said what does that thing do and jerry's like it makes milkshake i said you make milkshakes out of that and he's like yeah i said you could so you can make me a milkshake he goes you want to i think i asked i said can i have a milkshake he goes yeah i'll make you a milkshake so jerry's there just what you want chocolate or vanilla i was like chocolate obviously i like chocolate <laughs> so, <laughs> so so he's making me a chocolate milkshake and, it, and it's going. And Ra walks in. And he walks in as he's pouring me the milkshake. And they're talking. And I don't think Rod's putting two and two together. That he's making this milkshake for me. And then he pours it. Puts a little plastic top on it. Puts a straw on it. And hands me the milkshake. He goes, there you go, Gary. And Ra goes, what? Did you pay for that? And I go, I go, no. I, he, I asked for a milkshake. And Rod just snapped on me. Motherfucker, this is how this man makes his money. You can't be coming here begging for milkshakes and freeloading off him. His, his big word was freeloading. And, and just, I'm talking snapping over this chocolate milkshake. And then, thank God, his friend Jerry was a little level-headed. He goes, Rod, it's a milkshake. It's fine. He goes, no, I just, he always be doing stuff like that, man. He'd be begging for stuff. And I was like, he literally took like this wonderful moment of I'm, I really was interested in how this diner worked. He was showing me how the fryer worked, where they store the meat. He, I mean, that whole 45 minutes I was there before I got there, it was just me and Jerry talking about boating, living in Kentucky, just nothing. Whatever a 10-year-old can talk to a grown man about. And then, you know, oh my God, as any kid would do, that thing makes milkshakes? I So I can have a milkshake? You want a milkshake? Yeah, I want a milkshake. You know, and it was such a cool moment. And I was, I, it, it was the work, worst milkshake I ever drank because of Rod, because I felt so guilty. I wanted to throw it away. And I was like, but I was like, forced to, no, nah, no, nah, that milkshake was fire. I ain't gonna lie, it was good. I'm about to throw it away. But I remember I was just like, I felt so, because when he yelled, my stomach dropped. And I was like, I remember I felt so bad drinking a milkshake. <laughs> I was like, I feel like an asshole. I was like, just sitting on the, I went to the front of the restaurant and sat outside the little front porch, just sipping on it. And then Rod just walked by. Ugh. <laughs> I was like, this guy just snapped. We're chocolate milkshake. Maybe it should have been vanilla. I don't know. I don't know. So enough about my personal life. Thank you to Talwan High School. Thank you for the, the Hall of Achievement Award. You guys make the right decision. And uh, yeah, it was, that, was, that, was, that was a pretty emotional 
pretty emotional night this week for me. Uh, so it looks like just when you think comedian beef is going away, it comes back. And now it's Corey Holcomb and Donnell Rollins. So Corey Holcomb went up at the the Laugh Factory. I'm sure it was a I don't know if it was Sunday or Monday. Sure it was Sunday. And Donnell Rollins, I got a video. And we'll, we'll post it on here real quick. We'll snippet of it. Mouth off my d- mild. M-I-L-D. You catch up. You ain't have some d- Nobody agree? So I'm wrong. Okay. I can be wrong. I'm talking about, but we at the, we at the, um, what is this called? This is the Laugh Factory. If we was at the Savoy, you wouldn't be able to be up here that long. Yeah. You'd be like, get your whole ass down, nigga. I catch up in the hardest rooms in Brooklyn. Uh, and what? you ain't never, and you ain't never with them rooms. You just yelling. Because I don't have a mic. I can talk to you straight up. You want to talk about it? You saying I'm mild. You saying I ain't come through the streets or the gutters is straight bull. And if you want to ask somebody, ask the mother. That you know what I do. So, okay, all right. Listen, listen. Let's be fair. Fair conversation. Larry, no, 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 no. Let's be fair. Let's be fair and real. You say you keep it 100. You know how I get down. How? 32. I rip. You rip lights? I rip. You, you, you ask any ever seen me bomb. Anybody. And you ask anybody that don't know me, I keep it gangster. I don't, I don't say you No, bomb. you trying to say I'm a bum. I ain't no bum. No, I didn't say that you bum. saw. That you saw. Your company is mild. It's mild. You, you know what? You know going. what? You know what you're doing now? You're a provocateur. You know how to incite people. Ain't nothing mild about my People look at you. Ain't nothing. If you was at the mall, they put you out with your hot dog in your head. And guess what? And guess what? And guess what? You can say what you want to say. You can say what you want to say. You calling me a mild comic is totally off. So you a strong comic. I'm a beast. I'm a beast. I'm a beast. That's right. Him and Corey just snapping. Like I heard Corey was talking about Dave Chappelle, and then Donnell stood up for Dave, and then things like that. And like I said, when there's no truth or validity to things it doesn't hurt at all when people are just saying crazy shit about you but when there's a little bit of truth to it no matter what it, then it hurts a little bit so I think here's the thing I I like Corey Corey trolls everybody uh, I think when people go on stage and talk about you like I said it's always a good thing good or bad your name's up and people are going to look you up and then they can make their own opin- opinions about you so if a comedian brings my name up on stage or in a podcast, it's uh it's it's fair game to go go search me out and then you can decide for yourself if you like me or not. So Donnell and Corey, all we got, and that's the thing, when 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 people post stuff, we're not getting the full story yet. And I'm sure when Corey tells his version, Donnell tell his version, it'll be a little different. But from what I gather, being an outsider looking in, this is what I think happened from my common sense radar. Corey went up and he was talking about Dave and he was talking about when Dave goes on stage, he goes long. And and Corey said on his podcast that Dave Chappelle bombs a lot. And I don't think he bombs. I think when Dave goes up there and does the, he, he used to do these three hour shows, uh, he just be talking and working his sets out. And people were like, I said, he's Bigfoot. They're so intrigued with it. They're doing, but Here's the thing. When Corey said Dave's bombing, man, we Dave is like one of the comics. He's really working stuff out on stage. Nobody is just a hundred for a hundred in the jokes. And and Dave's so just once he lights those cigarettes and he just up there, he's only just like vibing. It's almost like you in you in a studio and he's just like figuring out what kind of rap goes with Dave. You ever see the you ever see the uh people making record albums? And stuff like that. And they'll be in the studio and they'll the headphone. They'll be like, you know, watch, watch like a Bohemian Rhapsody. And they'll be like, hold that note a little more. Do this, you know. All right. Raise your octave a little bit. Or, you know, say this instead of this. Watch watch NWA. Watch that movie. Watch Bohemian Rhapsody. Any of these music movies 
where they're trying to get the right note or the right lyric out. That's really what Dave's doing when Corey's talking about Dave's bombing. He's not bombing. He's just working stuff out on stage, and he's taking his sweet time. And I always say, like, there used to be a time when Dave was doing these three-hour sets, then Dane Cook, who was killing it about 10, 15 years ago, uh, and Dane Cook's still killing it. Don't don't misread that. But, but those guys were having, like, a competition. Who would do the longer sets? And I said, you know, most comics can't do that. We would get banned. Like, if we if we went up there and did three hours, it might never come back, Gary. How dare you disrespect the room? And then, but if Dave or Dave Dane did it back in the day, they were considered comedic geniuses because they were on stage for three hours. And I would always say, like, yeah, they, I think they're both comedic geniuses, but that's not what makes them a comedic genius because any seasoned headliner can go up and do three, three and a half hours. They can do what Dave and Dane were doing back then, but we would get banned. We can go up there and just sit and talk to the audience. But it, listen, if you're not getting booed and the audience is staying engaged, I go, everybody left happy as far as I knew. Uh, but, yeah, I think Corey was – from what I gathered, from what I heard, Corey said, man, if Dave went up at the Savoy or any of these hood rooms, they would have booed his ass off. And I don't think that's true. But that's just Corey being Corey. I think Corey just he, – he trolls people, man, and he he talks about people. And I and Donnell, who owes a big chunk of his career to Dave, and Dave has really taken him under his wing, produced his next Netflix special, uh, has been on the road with Dave forever. You know, Donnell was like kind of standing up for Dave and start got, getting a back and forth with Corey. That's what I gather. Now, here's the thing. I think Donnell's wrong. And whether Corey was talking about Donnell or Dave, that's Corey's time on stage. So that he can say whatever he wants. That's his time. Now, you are more than welcome to go up when it's your time to go on stage and refute anything Corey's saying or go at Corey. But I don't want – I don't – it's it's not cool for a comic to yell out during another comic set, regardless of what they're talking about. That's just not cool. So I would definitely side with Corey in this instance. I don't have to agree with what Corey's talking about on stage. I'm just saying – I don't want this to become the new thing. I don't want it to be, yeah, you know, I don't like what you're saying, so I'm going to confront you on stage like that. Because that, that wasn't fun. That wasn't no winner. You got to respect the stage, man. That's all, Donnell. That wasn't cool, regardless of what he was saying. It, and it was such a – listen, Laugh Factory was so small, it wasn't going to get out anyways. This has only got traction because you yelled out. And it's, it wouldn't have changed the way people feel about Dave or you. A deep down so I think we just got to take a step back and I know you're saying you was defending your friend in this and everything and I'm I just think Donnell was wrong in this instance and it doesn't even matter what Corey's talking about because now it's like oh here we go again with comedians they got beef <laughs> uh so I hope that I hope these guys work it out because like Corey a couple years ago he went in on me and we had a back and forth on social media but then when I saw him we and me start laughing about it. And, and I, you know, I'll, I, listen, I'm going to make it a point to go on 5150. Corey's invited me. I told him he invited me in the middle of my divorce. I said, no, nah, I go wait till the divorce is over. Because I know Corey. I know he's going to ask all these crazy questions about my divorce. I said, I got to wait till it's final so nothing can come back and bite me. Uh, and I'm sure me and Corey got a lot to talk about. He snapped on his daughter uh, for calling her basically ungrateful and don't appreciate everything you did. And I, I'm not going that route with my kids. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to go on 5150. So the 5150 loyal listeners just, I'm, you know what? I'm going to hit Corey up this week. I'm going to set up. I got to get out to L.A. and do a, do a run anyways of, of, of podcasts. I just, when I go out there, I don't want to go out there for one podcast. I want to line it up. I know uh, Andrew Santino wants me on his, Corey. So I got I to gotta, I gotta find some time. I got I got some free time coming up. So maybe uh, I'll set that up. So you heard it here first. I'm going to go on 5150 uh, within the next couple months. I'm going to hit Corey up because he wanted me on a while ago, and I just said, wait till the divorce is final, bro. He was, man, people going to trip out. They think we don't like each other. I said, exactly. So, yeah, but I, I, I like I said, I don't agree with that. a lot of stuff Corey says. I think he's just off the wall. But, uh, yeah, I, I just think Donnell was out of line on that one regardless if you agreed or disagreed, that's Corey's time on stage. 
I'm sh- I, and if it listen, if it was the other way around and Donnell was on stage and Corey interrupted him, I'd be like, Corey, Corey's out of line. So this isn't ra- this isn't about what was said on stage. It was about yo, as a comic, we don't interrupt other comedians while they're on stage. You just don't do that, regardless of what they're talking about, whether they're talking about your boss, anybody. Just it's not that deep. It's not that deep, and it's we know what the, we know what the uh, comedian etiquette is. You know that. I mean, Donnell knows that. I just don't know why why it was so triggering. Regardless, if Corey said Dave would have got booed at the Savoy, it holds over literally if it ain't true. <laughs> so that's just Corey on stage ranting and talking shit. That's all that is, and that's what Corey does. You know, Corey does that shit. Like it's not a surprise. Corey does that. He talks about everybody. Hell, he talked about me. He continues to talk about me sometimes. Uh, I don't take it personal. That's, that's like that's what Corey does, man. Shit, I remember when Corey first got to L.A. I remember and Kevin Hart too, man. I used to always invite them guys to play basketball at the Burbank YMCA. I don't know if the Burbank YMCA knows this, but you know you had Kevin Hart hooping there a couple times because we linked up. I said, Kev, come come play basketball. When you're in your 20s, man, you just get to L.A. You just I don't know. You find a friend group, you just start hanging out. So I remember I invited Corey. We hooped. D. Ray came up and hooped. D. Ray can hoop too. D. Ray and Corey both can hoop pretty good. Everyone knows Kev can hoop pretty good, but yeah. But I'm sure we're all old now. But back in the day, yeah, Corey had Corey had some. Corey was a surprise. Corey had hops. Corey old dunk. I was like, yo, I saw him get up two hand dunk it. He's like a Barkley. I was like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, out, out of all of them, like like D. Ray was nice. Kev is nice. Honestly, I think Corey Holcomb was better than both of them when it came down to him basketball. Obviously, we will never be able to definitively answer that question because we're all old now. But I'm saying I've I've hooped with D-Ray, I've hooped with Corey Holcomb, and I've heard with Ke- hooped with Kevin Hart. And to me, Corey was the best of all of them. That When he went up and dunked that shit with two hands, I went, what the hell was that? He was like just a big muscle dude that was – his game was nice, bro. I'm telling you. You heard it for Corey could hoop. So, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go on 5150 for sure. For sure, I have to. Uh, so I, I with 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 the comedian beef and everything that's going on, man, comedians, man, we got some funny stories out there. We got some funny stories, and I think we were in a state of all the stories have been bad lately. So I'll just I just tell you a funny one, and I don't know if I've told this in the past or not, but this story is just so funny to me. So there was one time I had a show in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I don't know, the promoter, I got, I don't know, this is before I had, like, a good manager, a good agent. So I'm booking a lot of stuff on my own. I'm trusting that, you know, this stuff, uh, that the promoters are legit. This one wasn't. So I get this call. This guy says, hey, why don't you come to Chattanooga? We book it. Send half the money. He sends half the money. So now, okay, I'm going to play the date. So I dro- my dumbass drives to Chattanooga. I'm thinking Chattanooga is like Nashville, like four hours. No, it's like six from Cincinnati, six and a half. I get a speeding ticket on the way down to Chattanooga. So I'm like, damn it. So now this is going to cost me money. I get down there. Uh, I got down there the night before the show, and I'm walking around Chattanooga, and nobody's talking about the show. And I'm decently popular, but this is probably 2008, seven. Like, I'm cool, but not where I'm at now. And so I'm like, dang, nobody, nobody knows I'm here. And at that, that, at that time, you had to buy radio ads. I'm not hearing shit on the radio. The only show I heard about was Cheryl Underwood was coming, like in two weeks. I heard no commercials of the show. It was me and Michael Blackson was on the show. And a couple up-and-comers, but it was me and my Michael Blackson. They were selling the tickets. Uh, that The comedians they were using to sell the tickets. And I'm like, I'm asking the dude, like, I'm literally talking to a promoter when I get in town, like, yo, we're I don't see no promos for this. He goes, nah, I got you. He takes you over to his clothing store. He's got this ghetto-ass clothing store. I go in. So he got the little poster on the window. And he got flyers at the counter. I said, "You, you got a street team?" He goes, "Yeah, we're just, you know, I think my, you know, my cousin and stuff are passing them out." And I'm like, "Dude, I don't think nobody knows I'm in town." I'm talking. We're going to a soul food restaurant. They don't know I'm there. We went to a nightclub. Nobody knew I was in town. This is all the night for the show. I said, "I got a bad feeling about this show." Michael Blackson comes in the next day. And I guess Michael Blackson had met with this promoter and sold him that you could make a lot of money off a comedy show. So this guy was a first-time promoter, didn't have a lot of money. 
And he basically mortgaged his life savings on this show, from what I gather. So when I get there, I'm supposed to get half my money before I go on stage. So he gives me, and I'm making numbers up. Let's say I did the show for $2,000. So he sent the 1000 a month in advance to lock me in. So now we're on the night of the show. He gives me 500 in cash. So I'm like, well, I'm supposed to get 1000 a night. He goes, and he writes me a personal check for the other 500. So I've gotten 75% of my money, but I'm short the other 25%. So usually comedians can make a stand here, like I'm not going up, you know, go get the money. But it's Saturday night, banks are closed. I don't know if you can get the money at the ATM. Now I got to make a choice. Don't go up, but I did get 75% of my money, or go up, and hopefully this check doesn't bounce, and he's good for it. I decided to go up. When I tell you, this theater held 2,000 people, 20, maybe 30 people in this theater. I never experienced nothing like this. Do you, ever, you ever gone up in front of an empty theater? It's, oh my God. It's like, what happened? I could bring anybody. I could bring, I could bring like, <laughs> I don't know. I could bring somebody who works at CVS and somebody who works at Rite Aid and sell 20 tickets if I just promote it right. And I'll go, so I, I we do the show, and that's when I find out the guy tells me, Michael Blackson told me, man, all I got to do is rent the venue out. Our names will sell this the, this out. And I was like, uh, okay. Blackson sold you up the river. So I drive back to Cincinnati the next day. That check bounced so high, it's still going up. Like, my bank called, yeah, that check bounced. And I literally warned him when I deposited. I said, I don't know. I was with the small bank at that time in Cincinnati. I said, I don't know if this is going to go through. My banker called me. She goes, that's what she said. She goes, Gary, it's still it's still going up. It's never come down. That's how high it bounced. And I was like, dang, I had a feeling. So I want to call this dude and cuss him out, right? So I said, nah, I, I'm, I'm going to be cool. So I had my ex, Kenya, call him. Because I said, Kenya, I'm, I'm going to snap on him. So if you, you, you're a woman, use that woman femininity stuff and, and try to finesse the money out of them. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm a rate right now. I'm looking like this. She calls him and then I, you know, she gets off the phone and she goes, she goes, Gary, I thought I was going to call and go off on him. She goes, I feel so bad for him. And I'm not lying. I told him, don't worry about it. I said, you do what? You do what? <laughs> she goes, I told him, don't worry about it. She goes, this is what he just told me. He said, Michael Blackson told me to do this show. He's a small business owner. He owns his clothing store in Chattanooga. It's not making a lot of money. He took all these loans out for this show. And I'm guessing the over, who knows what the over it was, but I don't know what the theater cost, what he spent on promotion and what he paid me and Michael and the other, uh, I think there was one other opener. Could have been a lot of money to pay the other opener, but he basically said, He's now going to things he thinks got far from bankruptcy. He's got to sell his clothing store and he's moving back to Atlanta and with his mom. He lost everything on the show. I was like, "What?" And Kenny goes, "And I believe him." So we're just going to let it go. And I was like, "Oh." <laughs> I was like So that was the Chattanooga story of the first time promoter that didn't know how to promote that I did get 70 75% of my money. But here's the bad part. That speeding ticket Took me over the edge with my insurance. That was like, for, I, man, I had a bad run there that year. I've had like three speeding tickets in one year. And so now my insurance went up. And so that that show, probably I probably lost money in the long run because I had to pay the fine on the speeding ticket. My insurance went up just a little bit that I had to pay off until I stopped getting speeding tickets and stopped having a lead foot. That, that happens with age. You start driving slower. And uh, But I met Brad, who's still my good friend to this day who also came to my award ceremony uh, the other night. So I appreciate you coming in, Brad, for it. That's why I said I got, I got good friends. So I ended up meeting one of, the, one of probably my better friends in life because of that show in Chattanooga. And he was I think he was helping Michael Blackson on that show. But we just started talking and connected. So I guess it was worth it. And I hope that guy, whoever you are, and if you're hearing this podcast, I hope you're on your feet now, bro. Uh, it's one thing to get ripped off on purpose to, you know, oh, oh. When I called him, that's what happened. I did call him, and I got on the phone, and I said, hey, your check bounced. And he goes, oh, 
man, I thought that might happen. <laughs> I was like, what? That's when I was like, I think I gave the phone to Kenya. I said, Kenya, talk to him. I, I can't. And then uh, when he's – listen, it's hard to get mad at somebody that just owns it. Because here's the thing. I, I didn't lose – well, I guess I did lose money with the speeding ticket, but I didn't make as much money as I thought I was going to make. But clearly I didn't get ripped off to either because either, the guy sold 20, maybe 30 tickets. So in the end, I made a little money. Michael Blackson made a little money. The guy that lost was the promoter. But he tried. He just didn't know what he was doing. So now that I'm older, a little more level-headed, I look back on that show and I'm like, man, that had to suck to be that dude. He just didn't know what he was doing. He just thought, get the venue, hire the comics, and the show sells itself. And some people, that works. You bring Dave Chappelle, you bring Kevin Hart, you bring Joe Coy, that could work. But not me and Michael Blackson in 2008. That's not going to work. So... um, yeah, so, yeah, whoever if you, whoever that promoter was back then, man, in Chattanooga, hey, man, it's all good now. I don't know where you're at in life. I hope you're doing well. Uh, so, <laughs> I just remember, man, yeah, I thought that might happen. I was just like, what? So I want to snap on him, but he sounded so defeated. I, just, I remember, Ken, like, you got to talk to him. Please talk to him. Use your female stuff. Try to get this money. I'm about to, I'm about to snap. And that's what it was. I felt bad snapping on the dude because he just owned it. So. Anyways, all right, y'all, listen, I'm in Baltimore the next two weekends, and let me let me give the venues out for, I didn't get the venue out for Evansville and Wichita. So, and I'm bringing the one mailman with me to these shows, so I'm trying to look out for this dude and, and just, just help him with his uh, career a little bit. Why? Oh, are you kidding me? It's not on my, I got to get this on my website. Uh, la, 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 la. anyways, I, okay, I feel like an idiot. It's not on my website. I'm good, Ticketmaster. Gary, sorry about that, y'all. That was very unprofessional of me. I'm more unprofessional about my web guys. Why isn't this on my website? So, Evansville is the Victory Theater, uh, and that's March 30th and March 29th. I'm in Wichita. Uh, let me see. Wichita, Kansas. I'm at the Century 2 Arts Center. Boom. All right. So that's where I'll be at March 29th in Wichita. And then March 30th, I'm in Evansville. So, all right, y'all. We will, uh, we'll see you next week. This is Gary with the Get Some Podcast.